책을 통해 보다 가깝게, 보다 즐겁게 이야기를 나누는 축제의 장, 인터파크 도서 북잼 콘서트에 와주신 여러분을 환영합니다. 네, 오늘 행사의 진행을 맡은 저는 인터파크 도서 책 매거진 북디비의 최규화 기자라고 합니다. 다시 한번 인사드리겠습니다. 오늘 북잼 콘서트는 2017년 새해를 맞아서 특별 초청 강연으로 준비됐습니다. 많은 분들이 이분의 방문을 기다려 주셨을 텐데요. 이번에 처음으로 한국을 방문해 주셨습니다. 바로 이기적 유전자의 저자, 세계적인 석학 리처드 도킨스 교수님입니다. 오늘 강연은 진화의 다음 단계는 무엇인가 라는 주제로 1시간 반 동안 진행됩니다. 리처드 동키스 교수님 또한 이번 방문을 아주 기대하셨다고 하는데요. 네, 더 이상 지체하지 않고 오늘의 주인공을 모셔보겠습니다. 여러분들 큰 박수로 환영해 주십시오. 네. Well, thank you very much. Can you all hear me? And especially can the interpreters hear me? When I give public lectures, I always try to answer questions at the end. And the commonest question by far that I get is, what might humans evolve into next? And it, it is the very question which the organizers have asked me to answer today. But I have to confess, it's a question that any sensible evolutionary scientist will evade. You cannot in any detail forecast the future evolution of any species, except to say that the great majority of species go extinct, and presumably will, and ours presumably will in the future, unless we're lucky. So although we can't forecast the future of any particular species, we can, say in 10 million years, 1 million years hence, there's a little bit we can do. And I'm going to talk a bit about that, about the general problems of predicting future evolution. And then at the end, I'll come back to talk about a little bit of speculation about what humans might evolve into if we don't go extinct. But first, I must deal with the question of whether actually we are likely to go extinct, as the great majority of species have. The evidence is now strong that the dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago because a large meteorite, a large asteroid, hit the Earth. This will happen again. 65 million years ago, this colossal object, the size of a substantial mountain, hit the Earth at a velocity of maybe 40,000 miles per hour. The energy that would have been generated by that colossal collision was has been estimated as equivalent to millions of Hiroshima bombs all going off simultaneously. It would have been a colossal catastrophe, followed by several years of nuclear winter, total darkness, eliminating uh, much of life. Many, many, many species went extinct 65 million years ago. Fortunately, one or two mammals did not. And that's why we are here. The dinosaurs were a special case. Is there any reason to think that we possibly might not go extinct? Might we be privileged to escape the fate of the dinosaurs? Well, we have the technology. It's quite likely that we would be able to uh, burrow underground, have bunkers underground with provisions and seeds for the future, and thereby escape the fate of the dinosaurs. A little bit similar to what our mammal ancestors did 65 million years ago when they escaped the catastrophe und underground, perhaps. Just a few little nocturnal creatures. So we might escape that way, or we might escape by migrating to Mars as Elon Musk, who's pictured there, wants to do. That is a possibility. Not a very optimistic possibility, but it is a possibility. 
A more optimistic possibility, which we ought to take seriously, is that we might be able to stop a meteor hitting Earth. What could we do about it if we detected that there was a meteor approaching Earth? Well, the first task would be to detect the incoming meteor. The word incoming gives a misleading impression of the nature of the problem. This gigantic object would not be just a, like a speeding bullet heading straight towards us, and we could see it coming and getting bigger as it comes. Like Earth itself, it would be in an elliptical orbit around the sun, and our task would be to plot the shape of the orbit and calculate whether, at some distant time in the future perhaps, the orbit of this asteroid would intercept that of Earth. If it does, we might be able to fire a rocket at the asteroid and either speed it up slightly or slow it down slightly so that its orbit misses us altogether. That is a possibility. That's something we ought to be taking seriously. And uh, one or two people are taking it seriously. We have to remember that the, the risk of a really big catastrophe, like the one that killed the dinosaurs, is probably fairly slight. The, it will happen again, but maybe on average once every 100,000 years or so. So we probably don't have to worry too much about that. However, a smaller one, uh, one small enough to, say, destroy a large city, those happen quite often. And we probably ought to be taking steps to uh, anticipate and eliminate that possibility. We are beginning to get the technology. The fact that the European Space, Space Agency managed to land a spacecraft on a comet uh, quite recently gives us the idea that we could probably do it. But that was a little aside to talk about the likelihood that we'll go extinct and the possibility of our uh, escaping extinction. Um, other possibilities for our going extinct would be um, climate change and warfare, I suppose. However, if we set that on one side and assume that we're not going to go, go extinct, uh, what can we say about the future of evolution? Well, I promised you that I would first of all give you a general warning against the plausibility of forecasting evolution generally. In what sense generally is evolution predictable. The American theoretical biologist Stuart Kaufman invented a thought experiment in which he imagined evolution rerunning, going back to the beginning of life or going back to, say, the origin of the mammals, and say, what would happen if evolution started again and ran on for a second time or a third time or a hundredth time? Would we expect evolution to take the same course again as it has taken so far, in which case we could say, yes, evolution is predictable. Or would it take a completely different course if evolution were run again? What properties of evolution that we've already seen, what properties are likely to be repeated again, and what properties are likely to have only happened ever once? Well, short of pure speculation, can we actually look at the history of life and say, has something like that thought experiment ever actually happened? Has it ever happened that evolution has been rerun twice or three times or four times? And the answer is yes, by accident, as it happens. Uh, after the dinosaurs went extinct, the great southern continent uh, of Gondwana land split up into Africa and South America, Antarctica, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Madagascar, India, which then were separate from Asia. And evolution went on separately in all those places. So can we look at the course that evolution took in those different places and say, what did they all have in common? What was different about them? How did this natural experiment, this 
this thought experiment, this natural experiment, how does it tell us about the predictability of evolution? Australia, for example, started, the mammal fauna in Australia started with a very small colony of mammals, which happened to be marsupials. And so in Australia, we have a radiation of mammal evolution, which strikingly paralleled the evolution of mammals in other parts of the world. It looks similar, which suggests that there is some predictability about evolution. That is not a dog. That is a marsupial. It's a cousin of a kangaroo, closer to a kangaroo than to a dog by far. Yet it looks like a dog. It hunted like a dog. It behaved like a dog. And we know this because they went extinct only quite recently. They went extinct in the 1930s in Tasmania. You can even look on YouTube for a film of this wonderful priceless animal which was hunted to extinction by humans in Tasmania. Uh, and you think it was a dog, but it's not. It's a, it's a marsupial. So there is a predictability in evolution. You can expect to get something like a dog if you start with an early mammal. Those three animals all look like moles. One of them is what we would call a mole. The one at the bottom is actually a marsupial, again from Australia. It looks like a mole, it behaves like a mole, its way of life is like a mole, but it's not a mole. And the one on the left is also not a mole. It evolved in Africa, it behaves like a mole, looks like a mole. We are seeing the predictability of evolution, that you can expect to get a mole-like creature if you start off with an early mammal in an isolated continent. Those two animals look almost exactly alike. They behave almost exactly alike. The one on the right is a squirrel, a rodent. The one on the left is a marsupial from Australia. There's a predictability. You can predict that you'll get something like a flying squirrel. And those are not the only two, by the way. Those two animals, both extinct. Uh, the top one is the saber-toothed tiger. It was a cat. The bottom one is a marsupial, in this case from South America, which again independently evolved the saber-tooth-like way of life. Must have been just as terrifying as the real cat, saber-tooth. But yet it was entirely independently evolved. It's a marsupial. Even before the dinosaurs came on the scene, way before the dinosaurs came on the scene, our own mammal-like ancestors produced a radiation of creatures which look similar to the dinosaurs and which look similar to the radiations which happened after the dinosaurs went extinct. Once again, this is like rerunning evolution. In this case, not on a different continent, but in an earlier period. Sometimes they don't look the same. In Australia, the equivalent of antelopes, the equivalent of cattle, the equivalent of horses, were or are marsupials. They're kangaroos. They look different. They behave differently. They have the same kind of way of life. They're grazers um, or br browsers. Um, and because they early on took to hopping on two legs rather than galloping on four legs, uh, they um, they evolved in a completely different direction. So sometimes evolution is not predictable. Sometimes evolution, if you made a prediction, you'd get it wrong. You can make speculative predictions about what might happen if humans go extinct. What would evolution look like after we went extinct? A rather, a rather amusing artistic book called After Man by Dougal Dixon speculates that when we go extinct, our place will be taken by rats and rabbits. Rats uh, will spread because they're such good scavengers. Rabbits will spread, they're so common already. And this whole book is a series of artistic paintings of imagined animals, which he imagines as being descended from rats and rabbits. And 
there's a picture of a giant rabbit being attacked by giant rat carnivores. The idea of giant rats is not that implausible, actually, because not very long ago in South America, there were giant guinea pigs, giant rodents, which were the size of a small hippopotamus, uh, which must have been quite an interesting thing to see. And there are reconstructions of these giant guinea pigs um, alongside modern rhinoceros and modern tapir. They went extinct quite recently. Now, I've, de I've talked about the predictability of evolution by this idea of the thought experiment, this idea of rerunning evolution in different continents because they're separate from each other in Africa, Australia, uh, South America, etc., Madagascar, and so on. But there's another way of looking at it, which is to say, how many times have certain things evolved, not on different continents, but anywhere? For example, the eye has evolved more than 40 times independently around the animal kingdom. So it's highly predictable that eyes will evolve. After an extinction, you'd expect new eyes to evolve. If you think about life on other planets, if there is life on other planets, it seems likely that there will be eyes. They will evolve organs for seeing, because seeing is such a useful thing to do. In places where you can't see, either in darkness or in very, very muddy rivers or in thick fog, there are other ways of finding a way around. And a good one is sonar, echolocation, using echoes that bounce off objects and listening to the echoes, listening to the time it takes for the echo to come back, and calculating, commuting in the brain how the, uh, what, what the world looks like in a world of echoes. Bats do it, whales do it, toothed whales and dolphins do it, and two quite separate families of birds do it, cave swiftlets in Asia and oil birds in South America. So echolocation, sonar, has evolved at least four times independently. So it's moderately predictable that sonar will evolve. And we might predict that on other planets, especially say if there's a planet with thick fog, you're likely to get sonar. Is it only four times that sonar has evolved? Well, in the time of the dinosaurs, there were undersea reptiles, ichthyosaurs, which looked like dolphins and probably had the same way of life as dolphins. Dolphins have sonar. Did ichthyosaurs have sonar? Well, it seems quite likely they would have done. On the other hand, if you notice, that ichthyosaur has very, very large eyes. So they seem to have had good vision, whereas dolphins have extremely small eyes and don't have very good vision. So maybe here's a case where we're not predicting right. Maybe um, ichthyosaurs did not have sonar. This general idea of asking whether evolution has certain things that it can do easily, is evolution eager to go down certain pathways, like towards eyes, and reluctant to go down other pathways. Sonar has only evolved four times. Eyes have evolved 40 times. So evolution, in some sense, might be said to be eager to go down the pathway towards vision and reluctant to go down the pathway towards sonar. And we can do this game for other things. I've tried to count up the number of times that stinging evolved. Sting is venomous injection, injection of poison. Uh, jellyfish, spiders, scorpions, centipedes, insects, snakes, lizards, stingrays, the kind of shark, um, ordinary fish, um, mammals even, the duckbill platypus, the male duckbill platypus in Australia has a sting in a claw in the hind leg, and plants, stinging nettles. So the sting has evolved about 40 times, sorry, about, about 10 or 12 times. Electrolocation, there are some fish 
weakly electric fish, which find their way around not by sonar and not by vision, but by electric fields. The fish generates an electric field, and it monitors with special sense organs down the side of the body. It monitors the distortion of the electric field, and thereby builds up a picture of the world around it by the distortion of the electric field. Now, what's interesting is that this has evolved twice, only twice, once in South America and once in Africa. Two entirely different families of fish have evolved electrolocation. And they've done it in different ways. And I'll illustrate that with one example. In order for electrolocation to work, the body of the fish has to be stiff, has to be rigid, a straight line, while the fish is using its electric sense. If it was waving about like an ordinary fish, like that, then the electric field would be distorted, and, it, and the fish couldn't detect uh, the incoming um, electric field properly. So the fish has to swim in a straight, keep its body straight. Well, that's difficult for a fish, because the way fish swim is by waggling the whole body, by moving the whole body in a S-shaped wave. So what these fish do is they keep the body stiff, but they have one long fin which runs right along the body from front to back. But fascinatingly, in the uh, South American fish, this long fin runs along the ventral surface there, but in the African fish, it runs along the back. So they both do the same trick. They both independently evolve the same trick. But one of them does it on the ventral surface, and one of them does it on the dorsal surface. So we have here an example of something which has evolved twice independently, as opposed to the eye, which has evolved 40 times independently. So evolution seems more eager to go down the vision towards vision, to go down the path towards vision, than to go down the path towards electrolocation. Flight. How many times has flight evolved? Well, four times as far as we know. It's evolved in insects, birds, bats, and pterosaurs, extinct reptiles. I'm talking now about true flapping flight, where the bird can stay up or glide like that for indefinite periods. There are also quite a lot of examples of animals that don't properly fly, but glide. Um, flying squirrels, I've already mentioned, flying fish, flying lizards, flying frogs. There are also flying snakes. And these animals often live up trees, and they jump off a tree, and then they glide, in a, mostly going downwards, but some up, and land on another tree or land on the ground. So this is not true flight but it might be regarded as the evolutionary origin of true flight. That's controversial. How many times has jet propulsion evolved? Well, squids are masters of jet propulsion. Squids shoot water out of the, the um, central chamber in a jet forwards, and so they shoot backwards at immense speed. And um, some of them can go, do it so fast that they've also independently discovered the flying fish way of life. They shoot out of the water and then glide for a long way out of the water and then land back in the sea again. Scallops have jet propulsion in a small way. They're not really very impressive, but when a, when a scallop moves, it does that with its shell. You might think that it would, it would go backwards when it does that, but actually it goes that way. And the reason is that every time it closes its shell like that, it shoots water out of the back, out of two little jets at the back. And so the jets propel it forward. So jet propulsion has evolved twice, at least. How many times has the wheel evolved? Well, almost none, apart from in humans. Um, the only true wheel I can think of in nature is the bacterial flagellum. 
bacteria, many flagella, many bacteria have a flagellum, a kind of whip-like hair, uh, which whirls around and they propel themselves through the water with this whip-like hair that whirls around. And it's a true wheel, it has a true axle, which goes round and round with a little, little motor. What you see there is the little motor which drives it round and round. That may be the only example of a true wheel in nature, apart from man. Are there any good ideas we can think of, we humans can think of, which have literally never evolved in nature? Evolution is so reluctant to evolve them in, in a sense that they've never evolved. Well, radio is one. We humans have invented radio, but there is no example of radio arising in nature through biological evolution. Maybe on other planets, but not on our planet. Fire is another thing that might have evolved. You might imagine that fire could have evolved, um, use of fire. And apparently only humans use fire. Our ancestors, Homo erectus, the previous species, it developed the use of fire uh, more than a million years ago. This apparently never happened. And in the time of the dinosaurs, if the dinosaurs had not, extinct, not gone extinct, you might have asked yourself the question, could dinosaurs have evolved into becoming intelligent creatures walking on two legs with a big brain like us? And what you see on the right there is a speculation of what might have evolved from what you see on the left. On the left is a real dinosaur. Many dinosaurs, as you know, walked on two legs anyway, which is a good start for becoming human. And uh, what never happened is the picture on the right, which is a speculation for a, a human-like dinosaur. So to conclude this section on the general predictability of evolution and how difficult it is, what I would say to sum up is that you cannot predict evolution in detail. You cannot say this species will evolve into that something. You can, say, you can predict evolution in a sort of general way. You can say that if you start off with a clean continent, uh, like after the dinosaurs, if you start off with, say, nothing there or only a very few species there, you can predict that you will get something like a big carnivore, something like a small carnivore, a, a, a medium-sized carnivore, a big herbivore, a medium-sized herbivore, a small herbivore. You will get maybe flying animals, you'll get eyes, you may get echolocation, you'll get swimming animals, you'll get animals that live up trees, you'll get animals like moles that live underground, you'll get gliding animals. Um, digging animals, but you cannot predict exactly what will happen. And that's the reason why I'm reluctant to attempt to answer the question, what will humans evolve into next, if anything? However, having given that prediction, what you see there is a reconstruction of the evolution of the human brain which took place over the last three million years. At the beginning of that movie, you saw uh, Australopithecus, um, our probable ancestor of about three million years ago. And what you're seeing is the swelling of the human brain. I'll run that again. So we start with our ancestor of three million years ago. And this is an animation of the swelling of the human brain over the period of three million years. It's one of the most striking examples of, of, of rapid evolution that, that we know. Three million years is not a very long time by evolutionary standards. And the, the brain really has increased enormously in size during that period. So it's natural to ask, well, if the brain has been swelling like that for the last three million years, is it going to go on swelling for the next three million years? Are we going to end up with huge big brains in three million years' time? And in some ways, that would be rather nice if we had very big brains in the future, 
It's very unlikely that anything like Donald Trump would ever happen again, for example. Um, but unfortunately, I don't think this is very likely. In order for something like the swelling of the brain to happen, it would be necessary for natural selection, Darwinian natural selection, generation by generation, to favor the larger brained individuals. And that means, if you think about it, that in, as the generations go by, the larger brained individuals either survive best and or have the most children. Is that likely to happen in the future? Well, um, it's not difficult to think of reasons why larger brained individuals would have had an advantage in the past. Um, there would have been all sorts of ways in which a bigger memory, more intelligence, ability to forecast the future, ability to outguess uh, rivals in the society. There are all kinds of ways in which the brain might, uh, a bigger brain might have been an advantage. Sexual attraction is another one. Um, it's quite plausible that cleverness is sexually attractive, that, that individuals might prefer to mate with clever members of the opposite sex, and that in itself, Darwinian sexual selection, that in itself would have favored a bigger brain. And that must have happened during the last three million years. Something like that must have happened during the last three million years. Nowadays, it's rather difficult to die young. In the past, the majority of individuals died before they reached reproductive age. And the ones who succeeded in surviving to have children were the ones who were best equipped to survive to have children. That is Darwinian natural selection. Nowadays, because of medical science, uh, it's rather difficult to die young. Most of us live long enough to have children. And so, if there is natural selection going on now, it will be nothing to do with survival, or rather little to do with survival, and most to do with reproduction. And so we have to ask, is it likely that in the next million years or so, those individuals who have the most children will be the individuals who have the largest brains. Doesn't seem very likely. Um, this is a bit of a joke speculation, but it may be that many of us in this room owe our existence to the fact that our parents were incompetent at the use of contraception. We may, we may have been brought into the world by mistake. So if there's any genetic tendency for incompetence in the use of contraception. By definition, we have natural selection in favor of incompetence. Natural selection in favor of fumbling inability to use a contraceptive. Maybe natural selection in favor of a generalized fumbling incompetence. Um, it's not a very optimistic prospect, but you see what I'm saying. I'm, I'm making the point that this is unlikely to be a selection in favor of bigger brains. If you ask the question, why do some people have more children than others, another answer might be just simply because they want to, or because their religion tells them to have more children than others. If there's any genetic tendency for certain uh, people to want to have more children than others, then again, we have natural selection in favor of that genetic tendency. Doesn't seem very plausible. Mostly, it's likely to be cultural evolution. So to summarize on that, the, the question, are the cleverest individuals in our society the ones who have the most children? Uh, I think the answer is fairly clearly not. We cannot predict, we should not predict, that we're going to go on getting bigger brains. The trend I showed you in that movie is unlikely to be continued into the future. Another question we might ask about human evolution is, are we likely to speciate? That means, is our species likely to split, divide into two separate species? 
much of evolution consists of the splitting of species into two separate species. That's why we have so many millions of species alive today. They all are cousins. They all can be traced back to a single common ancestor. And there's been a branching, branching, steadily branching pattern of evolution. As the generations go by, species split into two different species. And this normally happens because of some kind of initial separation, probably geographical separation. A species finds itself split into two accidentally, say on an, an, an island population, gets separated from the mainland, perhaps blown off the mainland onto an island, or perhaps a river changes course and separates a population into one population, say, north of the river, and one population south of the river. And now that they're separated from each other, they can evolve in separate directions, maybe by just random drift, or maybe by uh, natural selection on different sides of the river. So geographical separation, prevention of gene flow between the two populations is a prerequisite for speciation, for separating into two different species. Well, humans now have a global mobility. We can meet all the time. I came from England to Korea in one evening, two nights ago, one night ago. And we have travel all over the world. We are one species. We are one population. We can mate all over the world. It's very unlikely that we would have the necessary geographical separation to divide, to split into two different species. The only possibility for speciation might be um, if we do colonize Mars or some other planet, so that there would be very little gene flow between the two populations of humans, the one on Earth and the one on Mars, say. And then there would be the possibility of separation into two different species. We might then divide simply by random drift or by different selection pressures. Um, the gravitational field in Mars is about a third of that on Earth. It's, so we would be much lighter on Mars, much heavier on Earth. And that has profound effects upon the optimal body shape um, that's a, a fanciful drawing of what a rhinoceros might look like on the left if it was on Mars, say, where gravity is weak. The whole shape of the body, the best shape to be if you're on Mars, would be much more spindly, much more lanky, long, thin legs. Um, whereas if you are on, say, Jupiter, where the gravitational field is much stronger, even a mouse, see the picture on the right, even a mouse would look like a rhinoceros. Great, big, heavy limbs. Um, so we might expect on Mars that um, humans might start to look a bit more spindly, a bit more lanky, more long-legged, more thin-legged than they are here. Biological evolution in humans is now dwarfed by cultural evolution. The evolution of technology, the evolution of clothes fashions, the evolution of language, the evolution of habits, fashions, sports, all the things that interest us uh, are evolving by a process that looks like biological evolution. It has many of the same properties as biological evolution, but it is many, many orders of magnitude faster. If you look at the evolution of the car, or the plane, or clothes, tools, bridges, houses, there is a progression that looks like evolutionary progression, but it may be a million times faster, and it's dubious whether it works by natural selection or some other process. You can make a case for it evolving by natural selection, but it's not a strong case. And the point I want to make here is that human evolution in the future, if you're asking me to predict human evolution in the future, it's likely to be cultural evolution rather than biological evolution. The two influence each other. Cultural evolution 
is likely to have an effect on biological evolution. But the dominant effect you will see if you try to predict the course of human evolution, it will be a change in culture rather than a change in genes. That's just a, a, an il illustration of cultural evolution, the evolution of the car. And you could do the same thing for the computer or the plane or clothes or, 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 or language, which evolves in a very biological way. Finally, um, it is much noticed that uh, human technology is moving in somewhat alarming directions as uh, computers become more and more powerful, faster software becomes more um, sophisticated. And uh, computer technology is reaching the point where it can emulate human life to a rather alarming degree. And artificial intelligence, AI, is advancing to the point where some people are starting to fear that uh, human function may be usurped, may be taken over to a rather frightening extent. Are we likely to be overrun by robots of our own creation? If we make robots that are capable of evolving themselves, of reproducing and evolving themselves, could there be a takeover such that humans become redundant unnecessary slaves just whose only function is to manufacture the robots who will be our masters. There are scientists such as Stephen Hawking who are um, worried about this and are warning that we may need to take care whether we are sowing the seeds of our own destruction by manufacturing highly sophisticated machines with artificial intelligence. Um, we're moving into the territory of science fiction here, but it probably, since I've been asked to talk about the future of human evolution, this is something that I can't avoid mentioning. The possibility that human evolution may be the spawning ground for a new kind of evolution, which would be no longer biological, but technological, and might um, resemble biological evolution somewhat, but might take us into new realms which we can hardly Im imagine. And I suppose we could speculate that in the future uh, there might be a room full of robots, silicon and metal robots sitting, listening to a lecturer, speculating about the possibility that way, way back in the distant past there might have been some dawn age dawn age uh, before the evolution of silicon life, some kind of squashy, wet, carbon-based life that gave rise, to, gave rise to us. Well, to sum up, I was asked to talk about the future of human evolution, and I assessed the likelihood that we have a future at all when we go extinct. I explained how difficult it is to predict evolution in general, how rash it is to try, and I did this mostly by talking about um, animals. I then returned to the question of human evolution and explained that on the time scale of millions of years, the dominant trend of the past few million years, that's to say brain size increase, is unlikely to continue. I explained that cultural evolution is likely to dominate and its orders of magnitude faster than biological evolution. So if there is biological evolution, it's likely to be heavily influenced by cultural evolution. And technological evolution may even take over completely. I wanted to end on an uplifting note, and it's hard to do so uh, on this day after the election of a bizarre comedian, I would say, if it were not so serious and so frightening in the American election. But pessimistic and frightening as it is, the arc of history, as Martin Luther King said, is in general positive. Stephen Pinker, who I think has been speaking in Korea quite recently, in his book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, makes the point that 
as the centuries go by, if you look back at human history over the centuries, there is a general trend in the right direction. Things are getting better, we're getting nicer, we've abolished slavery. Um, only a century ago, women didn't have the vote in most countries of the world. We are getting better, things are improving. And although many of my American friends are saying today that they're ashamed to be American, I think we all have a right to be proud to be human because the achievements of the human species in science, in understanding the universe in which we live, the process that has given rise to us, is truly impressive, truly something to be proud of. And I want to end with the quotation which we all saw from Einstein as we walked into this hall, just outside there. The important thing is not to stop questioning. Thank you very much. 네, 첫 번째 질문입니다. 기존의 패러다임을 뒤집는 시선을 갖게 된 계기가 궁금합니다. I'm not sure that I have changed paradigms all that much. Um, I think that um, if I could think about the history of Darwinian evolution, um, Darwin himself knew nothing of genetics. And so the one thing that Darwin got wrong was genetics. Um, Darwin knew that there was heredity. He knew that in some sense, like begets like. Children resemble their parents, and that was enough for him to propose his theory. Um, however, uh, in the 1930s, there was the addition of Mendelian genetics. You could, call that, you could call that digital genetics. Genes are things that are either there or not there. And as the generations go by, what evolution consists of is changes in frequencies of genes. Genes change in frequencies in populations, and that is evolution. And the interesting reason why gene frequencies change is natural selection. Some genes equip animals to survive better than others, and those are the genes that survive. So that, I suppose, is the paradigm of neo-Darwinism, neo-Darwinian natural selection. Evolution is changes in gene frequencies. But it was still looked at from the point of view of the individual organism. The individual was regarded as the unit of action, which in a sense it is. And the individual survived to reproduce and passed on the genes. I suppose all that I did, and I was not the only one, I, I was building on the work of W.D. Hamilton and others. Uh, what I did was to focus on the gene and say that the individual organism is a vehicle, is a machine for propagating genes. So I kind of turned it on its head. I was one of those who turned it on its head. And instead of focusing on the individual, and almost regarding genes as just the way in which individuals pass on their properties. I focused on the gene and said that it is genes that use individuals as the tools for getting into the next generation. The genes that survive are the ones that are good at surviving, and that means the ones that are good at building individual bodies. And those individual bodies are good at passing on the genes by surviving, in the different ways that different species have, flying or swimming or digging or running or whatever it might be. So it's not really much of a difference. It's just a, it's just a, 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 a re-emphasis on the gene as the level of natural selection as opposed to the individual organism. Gene's most important two elements are the diversity and the natural selection. But the gene is present and the gene is present. 생태계 종의 다양성은 크게 나빠졌습니다. 그에 따라 자연계에서 여러 가지 문제에 대한 해결책을 찾아온 인류 역시 치명적인 위험에 노출되었을 때의 대처 방안을 상실하게 되었다고 생각합니다. 그리고 그로 인해 인류의 생존 가능성이 점차 낮아지고 있다고 보입니다. 이러한 상황에서 인류의 생존, 더 나아가 인류의 다음 단계로의 진화를 위해 the 
Diversity is important, and it's one of the problems with agriculture, monocultures, where there's very little diversity, and you've got huge fields with nothing but wheat and no diversity of plants. Um, it, it is a problem, and it, it makes us, it makes agricultural plants and animals vulnerable to diseases because they're all monocultures, they're all uh, very, 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 very similar. Um, humans are, um, well, we're, we're somewhat diverse, um, and um, I mean, obviously, um, if you look around the world, people look very different from, from each other, so we're not, we're not totally lacking in diversity. Um, it is the case that humans are a, quite a, a uniform species, genetically speaking. Um, it's been said that although we look so superficially different from each other, um, we humans are more similar to each other genetically than uh, chimpanzees are, for example, which is a little bit surprising. Um, it looks as though humans went through a bottleneck, that's to say the population of humans was was reduced at, at some point in the, in the past, rather small, and then grew out again. Um, this it was true of, of cheetahs, too. Cheetahs are a very uniform species with, with very little, uh, little variety. I don't think lack of diversity is too much of a problem in humans. I do think lack of diversity is a problem with um, agricultural animals and, and plants. 네, 좀 재밌는 질문입니다. 영화 엑스맨 시리즈 같이 초인적인 능력을 가진 돌연변이는 아니더라도 수리적, 예술적 등 여러 분야에서 많은 능력을 지닌 돌연변이가 인류에서 발생할 가능성이 있습니까? 라는 질문입니다. I haven't seen the film in question. Um, I'm, not sure that the, I'm not sure that the word mutant is being correctly applied. Um, if, if I understand it right, you just suggested that um, a human mutant might have be very, very radically different. I mean, not just a tiny difference, but a, but a huge difference, like suddenly growing wings or something like that. Is that, yes. Um, th that would be what you'd call a, a macro mutant. That would be a very, very big mutant. That won't happen. It never does happen. Um, uh, you occasionally do get very major changes in fruit flies, for example, which grow um, uh, a leg in the place where an antenna ought to be, or something like that. Um, I suppose that could happen. You occasionally get a calf with two heads, say. Um, I don't think it's a, in fact, I'm almost sure that that, was un, that would be very unlikely to give humans any, uh, any advantage. You're not going to get humans who can suddenly fly. They would be freaks, they would be, these would be monstrosities uh, who would not be uh, improvements. If you make a very, very radical change to an existing design at random, which is what a mutant would be, um, it's unlikely to be an improvement. It's going to be, um, it's going to have been negative. 강연 중에 그 생물학적 진화와 문화적 진화에 대한 말씀을 하셨는데 어, 그 부분에 대한 뭐 강연 중에 내용이 이 질문에 대한 또 답변 또될수 있을 것 같기도 하고 그렇습니다. 네, 어, 다음 질문 보여주시죠. 네, 역시나 어, 강연 중에 이 주제에 대한 말씀이 좀 있으셨는데요. 어, 조금 더 부연하실 게 있다면은 어, 해주시면 좋겠습니다. 현재 활발히 일어나고 있는 AI 혁명은 인간의 진화에 어떤 의미를 가지게 될 것인가요? 라는 질문입니다. Yes, I did talk about AI in the lecture and I haven't got a lot to add to what I said there. Um, it's a pity in a way that the questions were submitted before the lecture rather than after. Um, uh, so I'm not sure that I've got a lot more to add. Um, I, I don't know whether I share the pessimism of Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking, who are quite worried about it. I think it's right that we should have a precautionary principle and worry a bit about the uh, monsters that we might create um, unwittingly, and AI may be one of them. We, we worry about other things like nuclear weapons. Um, what, have, what have we done? What have we created? You know, Einstein said, if I'd known, I would have become a locksmith. Um, I suppose it's possible that somebody in the AI research community might say something similar in the future. Um, I suppose 
it's, it's just worth thinking that if we are taken over by robots and eliminated, um, maybe they'll make a better job of it than we do. 네, 오늘 자리를 좀 정리하는 의미의 질문이 될 수도 있을 것 같은데요. 예, 제가 읽겠습니다. 수많은 서적과 핸드폰 검색만으로도 리처드 도킨스 교수님의 사고와 그 가치를 느끼기엔 너무나 많은 자료들이 존재한다고 생각합니다. 그래서 저는 지금 교수님의 강연을 듣고 있는 여기 한국 독자들과의 첫 강연 후에 현재 느낌을 듣고 싶습니다. I have been here for I think less than 24 hours. And it would be a little bit jumping the gun, a little bit premature to ask for my impressions already. Um, I've been immensely impressed by the friendliness and the helpfulness of my Korean hosts who've been wonderful uh, in looking after me and um, helping me to put this lecture on. Um, I'm aware that my books um, sell ex exceptionally well in Korea, and I'm really grateful for that. If, if I look at my worldwide sales, sales in Germany and France and Holland and and Spain and South America, etc. Um, Korea is very, very high on the list of um, my best-selling books, and so I'm delighted for that reason to be to be here. I would like, in that connection, to pay tribute to my publishers, Jim Young, um, uh, who and and uh, Jin Hee Che. Um, of the publishers who has been very helpful to me and it was she who translated the titles on my PowerPoint slides into Korean, um, which, which I, I hope helped. I'm conscious that it, it must be very difficult um, to, to understand what I'm saying. Um, we do have a language barrier. Um, I've had um, had, had meetings with the interpreters, with the simultaneous translators, and what a difficult job that is. I cannot imagine how one can do that job of simultaneous translation when you're, it's going straight into your ear and straight out of your mouth. Um, it's an almost a superhuman skill, and, and um, I, I hope I didn't make it too difficult for them, and I, I hope that... Um, that you, that you got some of what I was, I, I was saying. So I'm delighted to be here, and um, I'll be here for a, 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 another week or so, and at the end of that time, I'll be in a position to give you my impressions, but at the moment, uh, that's, that's the best I can do. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, I like your necktie. It looks like a kangaroo. Do you hear me? Oh. No, you're, you're too far away to see. Um, uh, they, are, they are stags, they're, they're deer. Um, uh, you can see, you're close by, you can see, yes. Um, these ties, uh, this, this, this tie was painted for me by an Italian young man. I was, I was signing books um, in, it, in, in Italy and he came up and presented me with this tie, beautifully painted, as you'll see. If you come to the book signing afterwards, you'll see the tie. Um, beautifully painted. Not surprisingly, his name is Leonardo. Yes, and, uh, and uh, I'm a professor of mathematics, and uh, I, I, I heard uh, your debate with uh, the famous uh, mathematician and uh, theist, uh, the, uh, John Lennox, and uh, I hope that I can have some debate in the future. But by the way, my question is this one. You talked about uh, cultural uh, uh, evolution rather than a biological revolution for human beings in the future. But uh, my question is that the uh, uh, human beings evolved from a single cell to a multi-cell, like 100 trillion cells now. And uh, some uh, scholars say that uh, in the process uh, we developed uh, multi-egos or multi-personas. And so by uh, dividing the uh, two hemispheres of brain, and uh, they say that two uh, identities can appear. And uh, so my question is, uh, what happens if we uh, divide uh, some person into complete two halves? And uh, of course, we and it uh, ties to them. And then after they wake up, and for example, if you had that surgery, then which part do you think you will wake up? Well, th there are so-called split-brain um, um, preparations where people have 
surgeons have, have severed the corpus callosum between the two halves of the, of the brain, and, and they are remarkably independent. There is a, um, a syndrome, multiple personality syndrome, where, where people seem to have within themselves uh, several different personalities, and different days they may, may be a totally different person. It's very rare. Um, I don't know very much about it. It's been suggested that uh, one of the things that happens in early childhood is that you start off with lots of different um, personalities and they come together to form a single illusion of a personality. The idea that each of us has that we are a single personality is a useful illusion. Um, but th these are matters that are not my field. This is a, this is a d difficult psychological question. I didn't quite understand the connection you were drawing between that and the mathematician you mentioned. I'm not sure that he's famous. You called him famous. I'm not sure anybody that ever actually heard of him. The social responsibility of scientists. Science is itself a dispassionate activity, the, dis the uncovering of truth. Uh, the application of science, applied science in technology, can of course lead to terrible things. Uh, the hydrogen bomb is a, a, a technological application of advanced physics, and we all of us probably feel that the world would be a better place if it had never been invented. Um, the, pro the point is that uh, science is the right way to get something done, and if you want to do something good, then science is a good way to do it. If you want to do something bad, science is a good way to do it. So science itself is value neutral. Um, it's just that it's the best way to, to do whatever it is you want to do. The trick is to, to want to do good things and not, and not to want to do bad things. Um, do scientists have a social responsibility not to do research which might be misused in um, applied science? It's very, very hard to do that. It's very, very hard to say, oh, we shouldn't be doing research on so-and-so because one day it might be used in a bad way. I think I would have no little, little hesitation in saying that there are certain questions in my own field of biology which I would not wish to see money given for research in. Um, I can see little point, for example, in investigating racial differences in intelligence, which some people attempt to do. Um, the human races are undoubtedly different. It's, it's a falsehood to say that there's no such thing as racial differences. Of course there are. Um, but it doesn't seem to me to be a helpful line of research to say, are some races cleverer than others? What's the point? What, what do you gain from doing that? I think that social responsibility in science, uh, individual scientists would probably, should probably take the view that we do not do research on that kind of thing. There's no point. There are better things to spend our, our lives doing. But in general, it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to say the door should be closed on certain kinds of research. It's, it's, it's hard to, to implement. Scientists should be social, socially responsible, but it's hard to police. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Hanu. I'm a language teacher here in Korea, teaching Korean and English. So I know that uh, diversification is a good thing in the process of evol evolution, but Looking at all these 6,000 languages that we people, we speak as one race on this one planet. Now, of course, it was a natural thing to happen, but it almost seems as if it's a shame that we have to spend so much time trying to learn each other's language. Do you think in about a million years, we will be speaking just one language as a whole? It, it's very interesting, isn't it? Because you remember I said that um, biological evolution um, <clears throat> separates out uh, in geographical separation because gene, pool, gene flow doesn't happen and so it's possible for evolution to separate out. That of course is exactly why we have so many different languages. I mean we have we've historically um, been living in different places, different islands, different continents and so languages have diverged. Most linguists I think feel that all languages start from one common ancestor. Um, 
And certainly there are families of languages like Indo-European where we pretty much know that they did. Um, language evolution seems to be different from biological evolution in one respect mainly, in that it, languages merge as well as diverge. Biological evolution, divergence is very rare, if, it, if at all it happens, except in bacteria where it happens commonly. Um, but in language evolution, they merge. Uh, English, for example, is a hybrid of Romance languages and uh, uh, Germanic languages. Um, you were asked whether it's a pity that we have all these different languages. Well, yes, in a way it is. It would be nice if we could just all communicate in the same language. Um, on the other hand, I feel rather sad when I hear of languages going extinct. Um, the Irish language is almost extinct, and uh, politically they try to revive it. The Welsh language is threatened, but quite a lot of people still speak the Welsh language, which is um, a very beautiful old, old language. Um, there are literally thousands of separate languages in New Guinea alone. Each, in the New Guinea highlands, each separate mountain valley has its own language, mutually unintelligible. Um, how that happened, well, it must be something to do with isolation, something to do with the fact that there's such hostility between neighboring tribes that if you meet a member of the other tribe, you, one of you kills the other one. And so it's difficult for languages to spread. Um, you ask whether in a thousand years' time we'll all be speaking the same language. Um, I don't know. Um, that it, 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 it's, I suppose it's true that English is becoming more and more ubiquitous as a second language. Um, and this has the consequence that, I, I mean, the, the, the English are actually appallingly bad at languages, and for that, probably for that reason, that we get lazy. Um, because we get, well, partly we get lazy because we don't need to speak foreign languages so much. And it's, I think it's partly because we don't get the opportunity to hear other languages so much. And this is a little campaign I'm running in England. Um, I am tired of the way the British broadcasting media don't let us hear other languages. If we, if we are exposed to, uh, on television news, somebody speaking another language, within the first two seconds of the, of the foreign language coming on, the, the voice is faded out, and the voice of an interpreter comes up. And so we don't hear the languages being spoken, whereas somebody in the Netherlands, in, in Holland, say, um, hears English all the time, uh, and in Scandinavia, and that's why they're so good at it. Um, and I'm trying to run a campaign in Britain to, to stop this dubbing of it's not true dubbing, but voiceover of, of languages to try to improve the language skills of the English. I'm, I'm ashamed of, the, of how poor we English and indeed Americans are at languages. Um, but I suppose if we look into the future, what are the likely candidates for being a universal language? I mean, the dominant languages now are English, Spanish, and Chinese. Um, and um, I think, I, I, I very much doubt whether, whether the, we'll all be in, end up spending, speaking one language. Yeah, Seoul, Dongsong 그렇다면 문화에도 진화가 일어난다고 했을 때 인류는 그러한 문화의 다양성을 지키든 방향으로 노력해야 할까요? 아니면 단일화하는 방향으로 노력해야 할까요? Well, I'm not sure why you ask a biologist that question. This is a question for a sociologist or a, a historian. Um, I, I could only speak as a citizen, and I'm not a very well-informed citizen at that. Um, I think t there are times when we should simply have the humility to say, I haven't the faintest idea. I just don't know. I'm not an expert on that field. 
and people should not pronounce on fields in which they are not expert. We've had enough of that in Britain at the moment, where we've just handed over to the British people, most of whom know absolutely nothing about economics or politics or history, a major decision about whether to leave the European Union, a disastrous thing. Um, and so let's be proud of when we don't know, of saying, I don't know. <laughs> Well, there are so many levels on which you could be meaning that. Um, I shall take it as a Darwinian question and ask why it is that, um, why from a Darwinian point of view, we die of old age. Um, what is the survival value of death? A paradoxical question, obviously. Um, I think the right way to answer it uh, is, was originally suggested by the great Nobel Prize winning biologist, Peter Medowa, who pointed out that there are various ways of putting this. He pointed out that if you look back at your ancestors, not a single one of them died young. That's obvious when you think about it, but it's very important. Uh, if you have a gene, if you have genes that make you die when you're young, if you have genes that make you die before you reach reproductive age, those genes are not going to be passed on. None of us have inherited genes for making us die young. If you ask um, how many of your ancestors died old, well, all of them did. Um, if you're old, you've already passed on your genes. And so a gene that makes you die old has already been passed on to the next generation. So the filter, as the generations go by, the filter of genes allows through, you think of it as like a sieve, where you sieve flour or something like that. The filter, the sieve, allows through, allows to pass through genes for dying old, but not genes for dying young. So all of us are, are filled up with genes that make us die old. None of us have genes that make us die young. And so we are all a kind of dustbin for, for, uh, for genes for dying old. That's a very simple way of putting the Medowa theory. There are various refinements of it, but that's I think that probably gets the, gets the point across. That's the significance, the Darwinian significance of, of death from old age. Uh, today, we have talked about the Korean doctors and a half an hour. Can you say a few words Well, um, it, a Korean audience, a very attentive audience, very, very uh, quiet and um, um, as though, almost as though you were interested, I got the impression. Um, it would be very nice to think. Um, I hope you understood. I felt um, uneasy about what a difficult task I was proposing um, to the interpreters and to, and to you. Um, but um, I suppose all I can say is, I, I think all my books have been translated into Korean. And um, uh, go and read my books. <laughs>